Hello, everyone, and welcome. I'm Karen McGlathery, Director of UVA's Environmental Resilience Institute and Professor of Environmental Sciences. Today, we'll be hearing about the frontiers of climate science. Um, this is part of a two-week climate ambition summit that is bringing together UVA community, global leaders, and the public to discuss the challenges of climate change and also the leadership role that UVA is playing in finding solutions. During the summit over the next couple of weeks, we'll be hearing from experts in environment and technology, uh, business and economics, public policy, and also climate justice. Before I introduce our speakers for today, I want to just note that you can, if you have questions, you can put them in the chat box. I mean, I'm sorry, the Q&A box, and I'll be uh, monitoring that and uh, we'll be trying to answer as many questions as we can during the webinar. So now to introduce our speakers, um, Scott Doney is the Joe D. and Helen J. Kington Professor of Environmental Change in the Department of Environmental Sciences at UVA. Scott is one of the top 10 most highly cited researchers at the university in the university's history. Um, Scott is an international expert on how the ocean carbon cycle is affected by changing climate, uh, including ocean acidification, reduced sea ice, and rising carbon dioxide concentrations. Uh, he works in regions from the ocean, open ocean to the coasts, from New England down to Virginia, and also in both the Arctic and the Antarctic. Um, Scott is currently the chair of the National Academy of Sciences Committee on Ocean Carbon Dioxide Removal Strategies and is a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Sciences. Before joining UVA, Scott was a research scientist at the National Center for Atmospheric Research and the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. He holds a BA in chemistry from the University of California, San Diego, and a PhD in chemical oceanography from the joint MIT Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution program. So Scott will be interviewed by Liz McGill. Uh, Liz is the executive vice president and provost of UVA. As a chief academic officer, she oversees all of the university's teaching and research activities. She is the first woman to serve as provost of UVA. Before becoming provost, Liz served seven years as the dean of the Stanford Law School. And prior to that, she was on the UVA School of Law faculty for 15 years, where she was vice dean and also the Joseph Weintraub Bank of America Distinguished Professor. Liz McGill is a distinguished scholar of administrative and constitutional law and is also a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and a member of the American Law Institute. Liz holds a BA from, in history from Yale University, uh, a JD from the UVA School of Law, and after graduating from UVA, she clerked for Judge J. Harvey Wilkinson III of the U.S. Court of Appeals and for the U.S. Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. So welcome to you both, Scott and Liz. And Liz, I'm now going to pass the baton on to you and I will disappear. Thank you, Karen. Let's see if I can perform the task of uh, unmuting myself. I, I've accomplished something so far. Uh, it's wonderful to be with you all. We were just, Scott, Karen, and I, and uh, our lifelong learning group was so excited to see so many people sign up for this. Um, I My job here is to uh, ask some questions and get out of the way so that uh, Professor Doney can tell us uh, some about some of the cutting edge and important things happening in climate science. Um, I want to warn you, Scott, that before we leave, I want to ask you an off-list question. So I'm going to warn you about it now, um, which is I, I want you to tell us all before, before we leave about one of your most interesting or harrowing ocean research efforts. But that's not my first question. My first question, uh, and I also want to say we are so lucky to have you at UVA. Thank goodness you came here in 2017. So first question, what are some what is some basic information that everyone should know about climate change? Yeah, so one of the things we try to both educate our students, but also when we talk to the public is tell people that, that climate change is something that's happening now. Often in, you know, if you read newspaper reports or magazine articles, it's always something that's going to be happening in the future. But we're, we're already seeing substantial evidence for climate change and it's affecting a whole variety of things, whether it's weather patterns and temperature or melting of ice at the poles, rising sea level. The other thing that we try to talk to folks about is that the evidence for this finding that climate change is already happening is very strong. 
it's not dependent upon one set of data or a set of models, but it really is coming from many different streams of observations of the planet from satellites to measurements on the ground. It's coming from theory that's been developed over the last 100, 150 years. And it's supported by numerical models that are based on those theory and then bring together the theory, the observations together into a coherent package. That's, that's uh, terrific. Um, so talk to us about some of the exciting new topics in climate science. What's the cutting edge right now? So, so, so like it, for, for, for many years, it was the question was, um, is climate change happening? And so we've been able to, you know, I got involved in this um, going back into the 80s, but there's been work going back um, since the 1960s. And for many years, it was trying to figure out, can we see a climate change signal beyond the sort of background climate change, you know, climate variability. There's lots of variability in the natural system. People are probably familiar with things like uh, El Nino's that happen every few years. And so the, the science has really shown that that's the, the human signal has sort of risen well above that background variability. And in fact, since the, um, since the pre-industrial era, the global temperature of the surface of the planet has warmed about a degree Celsius. And atmospheric carbon dioxide um, is almost 50% 50, 50 larger than it was in the pre-industrial era. So now that we've been able to show that it's happening, the question is how is this impacting people and the economy and ecosystems? And can we start to pull apart you know, specific events and see how much of what happened was because of natural processes and how much was because of human driven processes. And that's really important as we start to develop solutions and policies to address this, because that gives us a sense of what are the benefits of those policies. If, if we can say, you know, for example, hurricanes are getting stronger and because of human driven climate change, you know, we can start to say, well, if we do something about this, we can protect more people, we can protect more coastlines. And this is kind of the benefit that comes from that. Okay, so one quick follow-up, Scott, you used the phrase, the human signal is rising above the background variability. Just being a country, country lawyer here, what exactly did you mean by that? So, so and sorry, I use my hands a lot. Drives That's allowed. Crazy. So, so the climate is kind of doing this, right? Year to year, it's, it's bouncing up and down. We have some warm years and cold years and, and it varies regionally around the planet. What, what we've seen is that what used to be sort of one spot would have a warm year and then a cold year. Now, every place is having a warm year and they've been having consistently warm years. So the, you know, and this is true now for the last several decades, you know, the warmest, six or seven years on record, going back since we have temperature records in the 1800s. The last six, seven, eight warmest years will be in the last decade because the whole planet is gradually warming. And so that's the, you know, it, it's, you know, there's sports analogies, there's also lots of analogies, but it's, it's, it's basically that the things naturally go up and down. And people are always like, oh, the climate's already always changing but what we're seeing is really unprecedented. And certainly from the geologic record, where we are now, we haven't seen anything like that over the span in which human civilization has developed. Tiny points, uh, if you can speak up a little bit, Professor Doni, I think Sorry. some people can't hear you. Uh, I'm so a quiet what, talker. Sorry. what are you studying right now? What's getting you up in the morning uh, uh, to, get at it each day? What are you studying right now? So um, as Karen said, I do a lot of work in the Antarctic and the Arctic. And so we're trying to understand um, the, we, I work on the Antarctic Peninsula. So that's the, if you, if you head down South America to the tip of Chile and Argentina, the peninsula is right across the Drake Passage from there. And we're trying to understand, it's a particularly vulnerable ecosystem because it's warming quite rapidly. You're seeing a lot of the glaciers and ice sheets in that region 
melting and even in some places collapsing. And we're seeing big impacts on marine life. Everything from the smallest phytoplankton up to penguins and whales. And so that's, you know, that's a, a good chunk of my, my work is trying to understand how can we use that as a test case that, and then learn lessons that might be applicable in other um, ecosystems that might be more complicated by direct human presence. So there's a very small human footprint in the Antarctic. Um, but if we can learn things there, then we can apply them in other places. It's a great opportunity for an audience question that we, we just got. By the way, the questions I'm asking Scott are a combination of uh, things the group came up with and also submitted questions in advance. But we just got one that I think is a really nice follow up, which is uh, how much are the effects of climate change already baked in? And how much time do we have to uh, mitigate and turn the situation around? Well, so th there is a certain inertia to the climate system. You know, people will talk about it like a, a flywheel. So we've been spinning up this, the, the perturbations. And one of the biggest perturbations that's driving this is the buildup of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So as I said, this is carbon dioxide. This is carbon that comes from burning fossil fuels and also from deforestation. So we've been adding carbon for, you know, close to 200 years. And so some of that buildup of carbon dioxide, carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas. It actually traps heat near the Earth's surface. And so as that carbon dioxide has been rising, it takes a while for the climate system to catch up. So if we were to simply freeze carbon dioxide level, levels at today's level, it would take, you know, years to, in some cases, decades or more for the full climate system to come into equilibrium with that. And so that's where some of this is baked in. Um, one of the biggest problems is that as the planet warms, the ocean expands. Warm water um, is, takes up um, more volume than cold water. And also we're melting ice sheets and glaciers on land. And so particularly important for coastal Virginia is this long-term sea level rise that's a bit baked into the problem. But I like to think of it as the sooner we stop emitting these greenhouse gases, the sooner we can start addressing the problem. If we continue to emit them, the problem's just going to get worse. So yes, some further sea level rise, some further heating is kind of baked into the system, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't act now and the sooner we act, the less the impacts will be in the future. Well, speaking of what might have been a relatively speaking small perturbation, can you talk about the effects of the pandemic on CO2 emissions? So this is, um, and there's, there's a number of groups around the world that are closely track the, these human emissions of carbon dioxide to the atmosphere, as well as other greenhouse gases things like methane, chlorofluorocarbons, nitrous oxide. Um, but the carbon dioxide is probably one of the best tracked. Um, we, uh, in recent years, have been emitting about 10 billion tons of carbon per year. So that's you know a little more than a ton, ton and a half per person over the entire global population. The, because of COVID and all of the economic restrictions and restrictions on people's travel in particular, emissions have dropped. They dropped about 7% over 2020. And a lot of that has to do with, as I said, reduced air travel, reduced transportation. Um, but that's still, you know, that's a, a pretty small amount relative to the amount that we've been emitting. And so we'll probably be able to, we can certainly tease it out of the the emissions data, um, but carbon dioxide still went up over the year. Carbon dioxide, you know, went up by about five parts per million over 2020. And that's because currently the human emissions are much larger than the, nat than the natural sinks. And so in order to stabilize atmospheric carbon dioxide, we need to reduce those 10 billion tons down to about one ton per year. So about 90% reduction. And so a lot of the plans have been, how do we get there? How do we decarbonize the economy? And 
there are some potentially some lessons to be learned from COVID. Um, potentially, people will change some of their behavior. But given that you know that seven percent drop in emissions came with a huge economic and social burden for so many people around the globe, what we really need is our structural changes to how we create energy, how we use energy, uh, and our relationship to the land and to fossil fuels. So I suspect for you, this is the, um, this is the front and center issue, um, most important uh, <laughs> issue, political, social, uh, well, environmental well, you know, issue you think about. Now madness is over. Exactly, exactly. Yes, if we could, maybe if we could get, um, uh, the Baylor team on this topic, we could we could move quickly. Um, do you, uh, why for others should it be uh, front and center, top top agenda item? And, and this, this has been something that people have discussed for, for many years. There are so many problems facing society, both in the US and abroad. The problem is that climate change makes so many of those problems worse. It's a, it's an, it, it, it adds to the burden, whether it's, you know, malnutrition and, and food scarcity. Um, you know, there was a really nice study that came out uh, a couple of weeks ago that showed that although our ability, the agricultural science advancements, um, you know, people are, you know, farmers are able to grow more food per, per acre, but the rate at which that productivity is increasing has been limited by climate change. And growing, you know, given the world population's growing and we're bringing people out of poverty, we're going to need more food and more high quality food. And so climate change makes that worse. Um, I, another good example is coastal sea level rise. You know, so if you look around Virginia and up and down the Mid Atlantic, we're seeing uh, big effects of sea level rise. It affects urban communities. And affects rural communities with damage to coastal ecosystems, to agricultural land, flooding of urban environments. Um, and it turns out when you actually look at where the flooding is worse, it's often in places where the people have the least resources to deal with those sorts of damages. And so there's lots of you know, social justice issues, environmental justice issues wrapped up in climate change. And so sort of across the board, whether you're talking about disease or food malnourishment, all of the goals of trying to develop a more sustainable economy, climate change is an exacerbating factor on all of those. Thanks. We have some audience interest in uh, getting back to the question of kind of the cutting edge research that's happening now. And, um, one, one question, what, what would you say are major gaps in our knowledge about how to deal with climate change? Right. So, or you'd really like to see more work? Yeah, so there's, uh, you know, one way are these, um, these studies I mentioned, the, the trying to understand how much climate change is contributing to events. So often, you know, we, we think of climate, you know, climate as sort of being a bell curve, you know, sort of a a nice bell curve where, you know, some days are, are really warm, but you don't have a lot of warm day, you know, hot days and you have some cool days. What's happening is that whole curve is shifting as we warm the climate. So we're getting these more extreme events and that can be droughts and heat waves. You know, the US, the Western part of the US is setting up for a particularly bad summer for drought, which then exacerbates water supply issues, but also exacerbates wildfire. And so one of the things we need to do from the scientific community is provide sort of near-term information for planning. So, you know, there's, there's all the climate negotiations that are going on and all the efforts to mitigate climate in the future by reducing emissions, but water managers, land managers, foresters, town mayors, councils, they need information now as to how bad are things gonna get? What is the wildfire season gonna look like? Uh, what's the flooding gonna look like? Are we gonna have a bad hurricane season? Uh, what do I need to plan for for the next five or 10 years as I'm making infrastructure decisions, for example? And so I think a lot of the science is going into 
trying to help communities and help governments and tribes um, really get a better handle on what the sort of near term, you know, what's the next decade going to look like? What's the next 30 years going to look like? And then the other part is working on solutions, um, you know, solutions that would, um, for example, you know, we're doing some wonderful work uh, at UVA, not, not in my group, but other groups across the university in helping coastal communities develop solutions to flooding, whether it's, you know, for example, um, uh, expanding the, the um, vegetation along the coastline, uh, restoring seagrass beds, restoring oyster reefs, all of which uh, may help reduce some of the flooding damage for coastal communities. Or for example, the architecture school is doing a lot of work is how do we better plan our communities to deal with the fact that we're gonna have to adapt to climate change and some coastal flooding um, you know, for the near term future. So just have a follow up on that first question, Scott, the, the role of climate change in extreme events and the, the desire to have, of course, communities have some warning. Um, I'm remembering that, uh, I think that was that movie with called, it was Twister or with uh, Jodie Foster obsessed with the, predicting the tornado and, and the response based on her childhood experience. Are, are we close to being, what, what science do we need to do there to provide better uh, prediction to community and, and state planners? Um, I think for some things we're getting considerably better. So, um, for example, we, 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 you know, the science has shown that hurricanes are going to get stronger as you heat the ocean. So um, they, these tropical storms, whether they're you know, hurricanes in the Atlantic or typhoons, uh, different names around the world, but they're all uh, tropical storms driven by the amount of heat in the ocean. And so the, the ocean heating is basically the, the um, energy that's built up is then released in the storm mm -hmm. and gives, as the ocean heat builds up, you get stronger storms, you get bigger storms. Um, because of some changes in the atmosphere, sometimes these storms stall out. So a really good example is um, of where observations and theory and modeling is we need to give managers long-term predictions, like over the next 30 years, this is going to be the, you know, sea level is going to rise, which makes the storms more dangerous because more people are vulnerable. Um, the size of the storms are going to get bigger. So you need better evacuation routes. You might need to increase the, the level of who's going to have to be evacuated from the storms. And then there's near-term forecasting. You know, where's the storm going to hit? How bad is that storm going to be? And, you know, as I, I my poor students who are in one of our, one of our graduate and undergraduate classes, we used Hurricane Harvey as a test case for some papers that we read. And uh, one of the recent advances is to deploy robots ahead of these storms. So if you have robots in the ocean mm. that can actually measure the amount of heat in the ocean, they can give you a much better sense for how much rainfall you're going to get on land. And, and for example, Hurricane Harvey hit Texas with record-breaking rainfall. And you can link that to these uh, ocean heat observations. And so better observing systems that can give people a better sense for um, that these storms are going to be much larger than what we've experienced in the past mm -hmm. and gives managers and the public a, a much better sense of what they're going to be facing. Can you talk about the temperature targets in the Paris Accord and the consequences of them? You know, what what happens if we if we miss uh, uh, two degrees, or what's the different effect between one point five and two um, in terms of those targets? So, so the back up. So, so the Paris Agreement was uh, um, part of this uh, United Nations level discussion of countries of uh, a combination of what's the climate scientist science telling us and what could we do as a global group to try to reduce emissions. And so the climate agreement 
was these nationally determined contributions. It was completely voluntary. Each country comes up and says, okay, I, I'm, we're gonna pledge as a nation to reduce our emissions by a certain amount. And it was a first step. It wasn't meant to be the full solution to the problem, but it was to try to get countries, particularly some of the countries with the, the long history of large emissions to commit to reducing uh, emissions with the idea that, that after some period of time, then there'd be a reevaluation and those countries would commit to reducing emissions more. Uh, I think I mentioned earlier that to reduce human emissions to the point where natural sinks can soak up the carbon dioxide that we emit, we need to effectively end human emissions by the middle of the century. So that's 30 years. But to get there, you need to move much faster than that. So a lot of countries have made pledges to have dramatic reductions by 2030, and then by 2050, go to you know, roughly zero would be the goal. Um, most of these things, you know, getting to the Paris Agreement um, goal was to stabilize atmospheric carbon dioxide at less than two degrees Celsius warmer than pre-industrial levels, and hopefully much less than that. Um, if it's 1.5, that's great. If it's 1.6, well, there's a little more damage. If there's 1.7, there's a little more damage. Um, the objective is really to start moving because we have such a large task. We have so much emissions that we need to address. Um, there has been some work looking at the difference between what's the difference between 1.5 and 1.6 and 1.7. There are some tipping points or thresholds built into the climate system. We don't know those particularly well. Um, we think, for example, that if we get to two degrees Celsius, that a lot of the coral reef ecosystems around the world will be severely damaged. Um, corals, uh, corals have little symbiotic algae in them, and um, the coral and the algae don't like sharp temperature increases. And so we're seeing, as the ocean war waters warm up, for example, that, that you get bleaching the corals, the algae get expelled and the, all, all you see is the coral body and the, and the white skeleton. Um, you're seeing big bleaching events in the Caribbean, in off Australia, um, uh, off Hawaii occasionally. Um, and so that may be something that, you know, a huge difference between 1.5 and two. There's also some glaciers and ice sheets that look to have tipping points where if temperature get beyond a certain point, then the, over, over time that, that ice sheet will just melt away. But I, I don't want people to get too, you know, because then you get this sort of doomism of, well, if we don't get to 1.5, what's the point? And it's like, well, one, you know, 1.6 is a little worse, but it's certainly better than 1.7 and 1.7 is better than 1.8. It's really getting the ball moving on action that's important. So I think a couple things, uh, one, one question comes out of that, which is, I think a lot of people have the question, um, what can they do individually or in their communities? Um, I mean, I, I think I wrote down, you know, we need, to, we need to get to no net increase. We need to change how we produce energy. We need to change our coastal planning. We need, these are big policy shifts that we need to persuade governments collectively to take. What, what do you think about the individual? What's the, the, the best thing the individuals can do, joining with others or just themselves? Well, and I, I mean, I, th I, I still think the, the most important thing people can do is to be aware of the problem and politically active and express your opinion. Uh, we are fortunate that we have a, a country where we can actually um, influence government policy. That's not you know, always true everywhere. Um, there are lots of individual decisions about how you use energy. And one of the best things is that some of the simplest things to do are um, basically these win-win strategies, whether it's switching to more efficient light bulbs or insulating your house. Um, you know, uh, lots of energy use is squandered and new technologies are allowing us to be much more energy efficient. 
The next level is thinking about replacing fossil fuels with renewable energy sources. And so, um, uh, you know, in some places you have choices with your utility um, or as you, uh, as you, you know, for example, for your house, you can make decisions um, adding solar panels for things like that. And then you have a lot of, a lot of your footprint uh, is things like transportation decisions. Um, I remember years ago, I was still in Colorado and um, we had a, one of the professors who was working on our team um, was very proud that he biked to work every day, um, which was great, but he had the biggest carbon footprint of anybody in the program because he flew to a lot of meetings. And so one of the things I am gonna do is try to reduce my flying. This year has been really good for that, um, but you can make decisions like that. I would say that, that um, some of the things out there, like some of the carbon offsets um, have positive and negatives that we're, you know, we, we really need to make big structural changes. I don't think we can't solve this by individual action alone, but individuals can certainly make a difference in the choices they make. Um, whether it's energy use, um, I haven't talked too much about agriculture and food um, your choices in what you eat and, and how you consume and, and whether you can reduce food waste uh, can also have a big impact on greenhouse gas emissions. Thanks, Scott. Uh, we have a series of questions about, I think, one of your first loves, which is the ocean. Yes. Um, uh, so how uh, has our understanding of Oceanic, is that the way I should say it? Response? Yeah, that's uh, how has it changed in the last couple of years? Uh, and what kinds of interventions are being considered to moderate climate impacts? So how has our understanding changed and are there interventions that will mitigate climate impacts in the ocean? So, so one of the big things that's been of concern is um, so many people around the world depend upon seafood. Um, and it's for, for many parts of the world, this is not a, a luxury item. It's the main protein source or a, a central protein source to their diet for many, particularly some of the tropical nations in the global south. And so trying to um, combine our understanding of what's happening because of climate change with better fishery management practices um, is I think a really important advance over the last several years. One of the things that we're seeing, for example, in the US is that as the waters warm, the fish species uh, are, are moving. So mm. what you used to catch off of South Carolina, you might now be catching off Virginia. What used to be caught off, you know, Virginia and Delaware is now being caught uh, up in Southern New England. And so it's trying to help fishing communities adapt to that changing environment. Um, so providing you know, resources and education and tools for them to continue to thrive, even though the ocean world around them is changing. Um, a lot of, you know, the best thing we can do for the ocean is reduce carbon dioxide emissions to the atmosphere and other greenhouse gases. There has been talk about what the ocean can do in terms of climate. And some of this has to do with uh, where other reservoirs are carbon on. So you can think of fossil fuels as basically being dead organisms. You know, coal came from swamps, uh, oil and natural gas. A lot of that carbon was uh, plankton that were laid down in, in shallow seas tens, hundreds of millions of years ago. So basically this was that energy is sunlight that was stored in biota that died and was buried. But there's lots of carbon buried in natural ecosystems. For example, in mangrove forests or seagrass beds or wetlands mm. uh, along coastlines. And what we wanna make sure is that we don't destroy those important valuable habitats that also store a lot of carbon because if they get destroyed, a lot of that carbon ends up in the atmosphere. So, you know, a lot of work is, 
and a lot of visibility for tropical forests, the Amazon, Indonesia, but we need to put a similar effort into protecting uh, our really valuable coastal wetlands um, because they provide lots and lots of valuable ecosystem services, recreational, social services, um, but they also are big carbon reservoirs and there's no reason to destroy those and release that carbon in, into the atmosphere. Scott, we have a question about um, the evidence for a change induced by global warming in North Atlantic circulation and the near-term consequences of that. Yeah, so there was a um, couple of papers that came out a few weeks ago and there was a big New York Times uh, uh, interactive graphic that you could scan through with little animations. Um, so the underlying science here is that the Gulf Stream is this strong northward flow of ocean water right off the eastern US, comes up along Florida and North Carolina, and then starts to move across the Atlantic towards Europe and the Arctic. And it brings um, all this heat to high latitudes, keeps Europe, Western Europe, much warmer than it would otherwise be. And part of the reason for that strong circulation is that some of that warm water, when it gets to the Arctic, gets cooled and sinks. So there's, if you like, sort of a, a cell of water, some moving water's moving north, warm water, it gets cooled and it sinks and it returns in the deep ocean. And the question is, is that, that overturning cell, is it sensitive to climate? And we know that in the geologic past, for example, during the last, the transition from the last ice age, the last glacial period to the current warm period, that that overturning circulation changed and may have fluctuated quite sh sharply. And so there have been a number of studies. Um, the sort of geologic proxy data suggests that, that um, the circulation has been slowing down in time. Um, we've really only been able to measure it directly for the last, you know, um, couple of decades and there the data is much less, um, is more equivocal of whether it's slowing down or not. And so this is a really important question. One of the possible indicators that it's slowing down is that the surface ocean temperatures in the North Atlantic are one of the few places on the globe that's not warming up rapidly with time. The rest of the ocean, almost all the rest of the ocean is warming up there's sort of this hole, sometimes it's called the cold blob or the blue blob because people use blue for cooling on the, the maps. Mm -hmm. um, and this is, you know, this is of concern both for, you know, what will be the ramifications of whether this shuts down, um, but also are there surprises in the climate system that we haven't anticipated? I should say though, for folks who are, you know, old enough, there was that really um, cheesy movie that I think the day after tomorrow where, you know, the circulation shut down and ice sheets poured into New York City and, you know, the valiant paleoclimatologist came to save the day. Um, if the circulation shuts down or slows down, it's going to be a more, much more gradual effect, but it might affect how climate change um, impacts Western Europe, for example. Uh, differently if the circulation were to, were to shut down. Thanks, Scott. Um, yeah, can you talk a little bit, a bit about, I gotta see that movie. Can you talk a little bit about um, hydrogen-based energy sources? Um, right. You know, uh, I think climate influencers are uh, proclaiming right. structural changes Ooh. need to be driven by hydrogen and not traditional renewables. Do you have thoughts on that? So, so Backing up for a second. So there are things that are primary energy sources, right? You put up a wind turbine or you put out a solar panel and you use sunlight or the wind and that's your primary energy and you generate secondary energy source, which is electricity, right? So electricity, you know, we don't harvest electricity. We, we generate it for the primary energy source and then we use it. Hydrogen is the same way. There's not a we don't go mine hydrogen, but we use renewable energy, for example. Um, you know, potentially you could use um, 
solar power when it's in excess or wind power when it's in excess. Um, you can create hydrogen through uh, several different processes and that would act as effectively, it's a chemical battery, right? You have this hydrogen, you either store the hydrogen and then burn it later, or you can use it as a transportation fuel or as a, as a fuel. So um, it's really a question of uh, not where you're getting your energy from. The prime, we still need to reduce the fossil fuel use in the primary energy, energy sources, but could hydrogen help us in the transition of better using a growing supply of renewable energy. One of the concerns people have is that, you know, there's variability in winds, there's variability in sunlight. You need some, you, you need some basically some energy storage, something to smooth out those fluctuations. It could be batteries, it could be, um, people are already doing hydro pumping. So you have a dam and when you have excess energy, you pump water uphill to a reservoir. And then when you, you know, if the wind slows down, you let that water flow out and you generate energy. Um, hydrogen could be used that way. And it could also be used, as they said, as a transportation tool. So I think there are, there are positives, but people have to keep in mind that, you know, hydrogen is just a secondary energy source. It's not a primary energy source. Thanks, that's helpful. What you, you referred to this really uh, briefly before, um, and um, you said we don't, I think, fully understand climate tipping points, but we're learning more. Yes. Can you tell us what we know and what would be what would be nice to know in what future be, research? Well, what, like we don't want surprises, right? And a number of um, things that we potentially thought could be surprises, there's been a lot of work on and and we're a little more confident that we have a better handle on. So um, one way of thinking about the climate system is you have this initial perturbation from rising atmospheric carbon dioxide, but the total amount of warming you get is substantially more than that. And so this gets talked, it's, it's often called the climate sensitivity. Mm -hmm. And it's because that there are amplifying feedbacks in the climate system. And so, you know, if, if any of my poor students in one of my other classes, my polar class, um, one of the classic feedbacks that gets talked a lot is in the Arctic. So you have carbon dioxide that acts to warm the surface. And let's say you melt some snow or you melt some ice. Snow and ice are really good at reflecting sunlight back to space. And if you melt that ice or you melt that snow, you expose darker dirt or or dark seawater that it absorbs more sunlight. And so that initial, let's say you had, you would expect one unit of temperature rise from that initial CO2 perturbation. Because of this amplifying feedback, you might get two or three times as much warming. And so the surprises that people are concerned about would be, is there something out there that would further amplify um, that initial perturbation from carbon dioxide or methane, these other greenhouse gases. So an example would be some total shift in cloud cover or how mm. clouds function, right? If you look at a picture of, if you look at a picture from a, a geosynchronous satellite, a lot of the earth is cloud cover at any one time. And that actually reflects a lot of sunlight back to space. If there was a feedback where clouds disappeared rapidly, warming would expand greatly. Um, that would be you know, a, a, a pretty catastrophic feedback. We don't think, I mean, there are some cloud feedbacks, uh, but there's some cancellation. We don't think that's a, a major possibility. Another feedback would be if there was something that were to increase the amount of, if you add some carbon dioxide, you get some warming, something releases more greenhouse gases to the atmosphere. So for a long time, we were worried about um, methane uh, hydrates or methane clathrates in the Arctic. There's actually buried in the sediments, there's actually uh, methane gas that's trapped by ice, uh, water ice molecules. And so under a warmer climate, those clathrates might melt. Um, we think that that's gonna happen, but it's not really a rapid effect. And so we, we're, we're 
hopefully a little more confident about that. Um, there's still considerable uncertainty about um, the Arctic. And so this is, we've got some wonderful people here at UVA working in the, in the Arctic. Um, I'm worried about, for example, all the carbon buried in permafrost and whether that will come out um, as the permafrost melts. And then, as I said, one of the other tipping points would be if um, for sea level rise, if some of the larger ice sheets reached a tipping point where there was enough warming um, that you had a catastrophic loss. Um, and you know, that, that's something that a lot of people are, are concerned about that. Um, you'd have to be careful. And you know, I see these reports in the media, you know, the X glacier, you know, scientists have determined is catastrophically failing. And, but you have to remember that these people are, who are doing the science are geologists. For them, catastrophic is it might be over the next couple hundred years. It's not collapsing in a, you know, in a radical, you know, a huge wave. Um, but I think, yeah, if, if we were to find a tipping point for uh, rapid melting of Greenland or uh, the Antarctic, that could be, have huge impacts on hu human civilization. Greenland has about six meters, about 20 feet of global sea level rise built into it. And uh, the Antarctic is significantly more than that. So those would be the, the tipping points that, that I'm, you know, would worry about. So we have maybe eight to nine minutes left, Scott. I'm going to try for some uh, uh, lightning round kind of questions. Um, you're going to be I awesome. Some water, then. I think <laughs> I think you're uh, um, you got to stop talking about your poor students. I think they they feel incredibly lucky to be able to learn uh, and work with you. Well, it's just so, and, and it's just so much fun because we have such bright students and and they're so engaged on these topics. I I I'm not trying to call them out, but they just they hear me talk about this stuff all the time. So, <laughs> uh, so we've had a couple questions. Uh, are there organizations you particularly admire? Publications you particularly admire in terms of their accurate rendering of, of the science that you know so well that, that you would suggest people take a look at? Um, yeah, so, you know, and we've been talking about this earlier. One organization I really, so there's something, it's, it's, there's something called the National Climate Assessment. And it was written into law a couple decades ago that every, you know, five or six years, the, all the federal research agencies come together and put out a national climate assessment. And it's, it's the science background, but it's also how it impacts different sectors of the economy. So agriculture, energy, forestry. Um, it breaks things down by regions, looks at you know, sort of regional levels, looks at impacts on tribes. Um, I, I, that's a really uh, important synthesis of a lot of information. And they have multiple levels of of information um, to try to appeal to different stakeholders. So a lot of it's written for the general public. Um, another one is that I like is Carrie Emanuel, who's a professor at MIT, uh, has for a number of years been writing a, a primer on climate. Uh, and I think the link's now in, in the chat. Yeah. Um, they've now turned that, you know, it was a, originally a small book. They've now turned it into a website that's sort of a living a living document, that's a nice place as well. And then I think they've added some more technical papers on the chat that, that, are, that are helpful. Great. Okay, uh, most memorable Arctic adventure? Well, probably more memorable is, the, is, is my, my Antarctic trips. Antarctic, I'm sorry, no, Antarctic, no, no. I'm sorry. So, so um, the only way to get to our study site, so we work out of Palmer Station, which is a small station run by the National Science Foundation on the peninsula. Um, the only way to get there is by boat. And the boat's not very big. And if anybody's ever read sort of adventure tales of the Southern Ocean, the Drake Passage, it's a, it's a very windy, very stormy place. And so it takes about four days when the weather's good <laughs> to get from Chile. We leave from Punta Arenas, Chile, across to the peninsula. And um, we've had 
you know, 40, 50 foot waves and we've had to heave to for a couple of days just to, to wait it out. Um, I've been fortunate. I've never gotten frozen into the ice. Um, we we, we uh, go down, the, the, group, the group that I work with goes down every year and they, they have been occasionally frozen in the ice. Um, but, you know, getting across the Antarctic, I mean, the Antarctic is spectacular. It's beautiful. We work right up, you know, along the coastline with these towering glaciers and, and mountains. But, but getting there can be a real adventure. Uh, maybe we'll ask you for photographs later. Okay. Um, I, I have movies that, and Karen says it makes her seasick watching them. Oh, okay. <laughs> Um, this is an attempt to get a bookend understanding of the way in which the science has changed uh, at you as a representative of the field. So 10 years ago, what were you studying compared to today? What are you studying? I mean, you've talked about some of the things so, you're studying, but in terms of a decade ago to today. Yeah, so, so one of the things I didn't really get into is, is there are other effects of carbon dioxide on the planet than simply climate. And so... One of the things I've been involved in for you know, probably going on 20 years is um, when carbon dioxide gets in water, it forms a carbonic acid. And so as we increase carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, we're also making seawater more acidic. And so 10, 15 years ago, we were really working to document, you know, we knew from theory and laboratory experiments that you add carbon dioxide, the seawater should be getting more acidic. And so we were really working on, could we measure that in the ocean? You know, how much, you know, uh, what kind of measurements did you need? How frequently did you need to go to sea? I, I spent a lot of my graduate and, and early science going to sea, making measurements. And what we've done is we've just, just like the climate system, we've now been able to show that yes, the ocean's getting acidic. And now we're worried about, you know, what does that mean? And what does that mean for organisms, you know, for everything from plankton to shellfish, lots of things make shells out of, out of calcium carbonate, which is a material that's very sensitive to acidic conditions. And then I was really fortunate. I had some wonderful postdocs who've worked with me over the years who've been interested in how this affects communities and fisheries. Um, and so that really has been the change from going to can we understand the basics of the problem and show that it's happening in the world to how is this affecting ecosystems and human communities? And then well, yeah, what and, can and we do this, about it? Right, yeah, the what planning. Yes. Yeah, yeah, the planning, the what you, linking back to what you said earlier. Okay, so I have three lightning round questions in our last okay. five minutes. Uh, can you identify a scientific finding or understanding that really surprised you, then what's worrying you most and what makes you optimistic? Um, finding, well, actually, you know, uh, I have to say the, the acidification story was something that I was really surprised about. I was, you know, I, I, I was trained as a chemist and, you know, some of the basics, you know, I, I was fortunate I got to go to take some classes with Roger Ravel, who was, um, one of the pioneers of chemical oceanography in the U.S. And, you know, we, we, we learned, you know, acid-based chemistry in seawater for a long time. What we didn't realize was how sensitive some of the organisms were. Mm. And that came as a real surprise. It was some work in the late 90s and the early 2000s. And, and it went from an obscure niche topic that about five people in the world were looking at to something that now has a major, you know, the, a major national international presence. So I would say that the, we're finding that some organisms really were adapted to a stable climate. And I think this has uh, lessons for, you know, climate in general that, you know, we might not think that the change is big enough to affect people or ecosystems, um, but, you know, things adapted over evolutionary timescales to pretty stable conditions. Uh, so that was the surprises. The next What's one, worrying you and what makes you optimistic? Um, well, the, the what's worrying me? I'm worried that, that we'll kick the can down the road with climate change because it, you know, it's always been viewed as tomorrow's problem. 
that, well, you know, th this is facing us today, whether it's, you know, food insecurity or social injustice or, uh, you know, other pollution sources, um, you know, plastic in the ocean, for example, is a really big problem. It's, it's it gets a lot of attention. Um, but I'm worried that, you know, we don't see carbon dioxide, right? Carbon dioxide is an invisible gas. We don't sort of think about climate change. It's not as visible as a, as a pile of, of, of trash somewhere. And so I'm, I'm just worried that we're not going to take the problem seriously. And, you know, 20, 30 years from now, we're going to still be getting up the energy to make progress. Where I'm optimistic is, um, first off, it's, this is talked about in the mainstream media much more than it used to in the past. And when I look at the next gen, the rising generation, so the, the students that I teach, um, they're much more engaged. This is, you know, when I was a scientist, people wanted to be, you know, I'm a scientist. I'm not gonna, I don't wanna talk to stakeholders or people, or I just wanna do my science. And this up and coming generation really wants to solve problems. And so they wanna take their science and economics and engineering um, knowledge and really go out and solve problems facing society. Uh, well, I think I, I joined everybody. I know Karen is gonna come back and say a few words, but Scott, what a privilege it's been to get to learn more about your work and the broader work in the field. And um, uh, I think all of us who have the privilege of working at a university feel a similar optimism about the next generation um, who are who are gonna take on big things. And I think uh, the pandemic is only gonna make them more determined uh, to take on those big things. So I want to personally thank you for this time. It's, 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 turn it back. Always enjoyable. Turn Thanks, it back to Karen. Turn it back to Karen. Then. Yeah, thank you both, Liz and Scott, for what I found was a really inspiring conversation. And I think, as I would just echo what Liz said, I think Scott, you gave us a lot of meaty information to show both how urgent this problem is, but also some reason to be optimistic that we can take action, both us and also the next generation. So I really appreciate um, both of your time and your, your thoughts on this. I wanted to just end with a big thank you. Um, this uh, ser whole series, this Climate Ambition Summit is uh, done in collaboration with uh, um, Lifetime Learning and the Office of Engagement. And it wouldn't have happened as, as seamlessly without them. So I just wanna give a shout out to them. Um, and lastly, just to uh, highlight the Climate Ambition Summit continues on, um, on Thursday and Friday.